Hallelujah. 
And Lord, this morning we just take a minute and we just say, God, we welcome you in this place. Holy Spirit, more than welcome, we honor you in this place. We cherish your leadership in this place. Father, we want to be led by you this morning. Would you help me just, just show the Holy Spirit how much we honor and cherish him this morning? Would you just welcome him? Just, just begin to, to pray out loud and just begin to just begin to love on the Holy Spirit this morning. Father, we welcome you in this place. We love you, Jesus. We cherish your Holy Spirit. Lord, we still believe in your Holy Spirit. We still believe in the wonder-working power that comes. Lord, we still believe in the blood of Jesus. We still believe that the Holy Spirit has the same power today that he did yesterday. God, we don't believe that you stopped, but Lord, we just believe that you remain the same. Because your word says that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father, we believe it this morning. And Lord, we know that God, if there's a, a need in our life, God, if there's a miracle that we need, whether it's our body, our marriage, or our hearts, or our finances, Jesus, Lord, I know that your Holy Spirit is close. That, Lord, the blood of Jesus has, still has the power today to heal like it did yesterday, to restore. Father, I thank you for the leadership of the Holy Spirit. God, that you said that you would remind you of everything that you've ever been taught. Lord, I thank you for the guide that you are to us, Jesus. Lord, we honor you. We, we cherish you. We welcome you in this place. This morning. The king is in the room. Come see the scars of love upon his head. The king is in the room. We'll watch the darkness flee at his command. Who is this king? Who is this king? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Light of the world. There's freedom in His name. Awesome in power. Reigning forever. Light of the world. There's freedom in His name. He is in the room. Let me go bring out the
Then he rose up from that grave Made another king like this Now all of glory Forever belongs to him He reigns in victory Made another king like this There's never been a love so great He died so we could live Then he rose up from that grave
that on uh, Monday, 4th of July, horrible shooting down in, in Highland Park. And, and on, remember I said, a night of breakthrough and miracles. On Thursday, I went down to visit Dr. Roberts and her son, Cooper, uh, and her husband too, uh, Jason was there. And guys, I went into that room expecting to see a little boy teetering between life and death, and that's not what I saw. I saw a little guy who's making a lot of progress. I saw a little guy with motion in his hands. I saw a little guy pushing buttons on an iPad. Okay? And now hear me, hear me. I, I don't want to give you a long explanation, but I need to give you a little bit. I need, I need to give you a little bit. Because we're going to pray here in a minute, okay? Cooper, he turned to run from the shooting and that bullet pierced his spine. It fragmented, the bullet fragmented, took out his aorta, fragmented into his liver, and, and, and took out the windpipe, the esophagus. Listen, I'm a deer hunter. And I know what that means. That means over. But God somehow, God somehow began that intervention. I told, I told, I told Dr. Roberts when I was with her, I said, you know what? I believe with all of my heart. The Bible says, the Bible says that before you call, I will answer. And I believe that because there are so many people that are crying out to God for Cooper. That God pre-heard our prayers. He knew the prayers were coming. And he started working miracles in his life. That's what I believe is going on. Okay? Now listen to me. I believe with all of my heart that that's a foreshadowing. That's the first fruits of that little boy being healed. You know, the doctors are saying, the doctors are saying he's paralyzed from the waist down. Now look, where, where, where medical science and man's wisdom falls short, the power of God never falls short. I'm believing for that little guy. Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. We're going to pray. But I also want you, I mean, we're going to pray once, but I want you to keep praying. This is not going to stop until, until Cooper's walking. Okay? Listen, but I also want you to pray. You'll know what I mean when I say this. The trauma of that moment is forever etched in that family. It is, it is, it is so, the, 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 the fear and the, I, I don't even, I, I lack the words. What's the word? Help me. Fear of trauma. The trauma of the moment is so severe, it, it's etched in their minds. But how many of you know that Jesus can cleanse and wash, and heal? Not, not just bodies, but also the soul, okay? And so we're gonna pray, and I want you to, to, to keep those two things in mind, okay? We're gonna pray for this family. And those, those two areas, I, I, I just want you just to call upon the name of the Lord. I want you to call upon Jesus. I want you to call upon that name. Remember, P Peter said to that, to that crippled man at the gate, he said, silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. That's the name. That's the name. That's the name. So join with me. Join with me. It is in the name of Jesus. Come on, church. It is in the name of Jesus that we come before you. And God, we are asking you to do that which God would say is impossible. We're asking you to do that which God would say will not be. But we say in the name of Jesus that Cooper will live and he will walk. And he will live a full life. 
of healing that comes from the throne of God. And we thank you today that that stream, that that water will cleanse the, the hearts and the minds of this family. Lord, that somehow the very peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will reign in their lives. God help them. God help them. Step into their lives. Touch Keely. Touch Jason. Touch Cooper. Touch Luke, God. Lord, be with them. Jesus. We come against that spirit of fear. We come against that spirit of fear that would bind them. We come against uh, post-traumatic stress in the name of Jesus. We speak peace. Peace. And not only for them, but God for the, for the hundreds, for the thousands maybe, that have been impacted by this. We speak peace. Father, tonight when we get together and as we bring our the symbol, if you will, of our bondage, the symbol of our need, the symbol of the need of our lives. God, I'm asking that you would meet us in this place with that anointing that breaks the yoke, with the power of the Holy Spirit that heals, the power of the Holy Spirit that delivers, the power of the Holy Spirit that saves. God, I'm asking that this place would be filled with the very presence of God and faith and faith that moves mountains. Good morning. 
in the back seat pockets of your chairs. If you're a first time guest, there's a connect card. We're just gonna ask you to fill that out and hand it to Miss Linda. Yep, there she is. Uh, in the uh, lobby and she has a small gift for you. Um, and then tonight again, as Pastor Ken said, we have our glory nights at 6 p.m. Um, this Friday we have date night. Um, it'll be a night of food, fellowship, and there will be some games. So there is a sign up sheet out in the lobby as well. Um, if you'd like to join us. And then um, on Friday, July 22nd at uh, 6 p.m., you can see Angel back there. He is, um, he will give you any information you need on the youth game night. And then in two weeks, we will be having water baptism. It's the 20-something, I don't know what it is, on Sunday. So if you'd like to be baptized in water, fill this form out that's in your bulletin and give it back to Pastor Ken. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, sir. We're going to, uh, that water baptism service is actually going to take place at, at Shiloh Pool. The church has reserved the pool and the pavilion up there. So that's going to be our church gathering for the summer where we have our picnic and everything. But we're going to begin it by baptizing some folks, you know. And uh, so get that sheet back there. And uh, it will be good. It will be good. We're going to dismiss the children, the children's church. Wow. The Children and Children's Church and uh, Nursery will be open now. And uh, man, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I am really like chomping at the bit. I mean, usually when I come to the pulpit, I'm chomping at the bit to preach God's word. I, I am, don't get me wrong. But man, I just sense that something tonight, something tonight is going to happen. I, I, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. I, the whole time we were standing there singing, man, I'm just, there's something stirring in my spirit. And uh, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Anyway, let me get, let me get my thoughts to what we're doing now. <laughs> I'm thinking tonight, I got to think now. So let's, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you, God, that your word is truth. Your word is life. Your word is that, 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 that sharp two-edged sword that pierces and cuts. Your word is that hammer that breaks the hardened heart of our, the, the, our hardened hearts. And, and Jesus, your word is just so wonderful to us, man. It, your word is that tastes like honey. It's so sweet to our mouth. It brings nourishment and strength. And God, I'm asking that your word today would just minister to each one to each one. Touch us today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I am still in Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be there for a little bit. I'm just telling you that we're going to be in Hebrews 12. A series of messages that I've entitled The Pursuit of Holiness. And let's just, let me just read a few select verses out of here and then we'll get down to business. You with me? Hebrews chapter 12, starting, I'm going to pick it up in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, pay attention to this phrase, we're going to really look in depth at this. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race set out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Don't you just love him? The author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And now I'm going to jump down to verse 14. Pursue peace with everyone as well as holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue holiness 
without which no one will see the Lord. I'm going to key in on verse 1, that one little segment of verse 1. Let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles. In today's church, we hear a lot about purpose. What is my purpose? What's my purpose in life? What's my calling? What's my ministry? And friends, I'm telling you, discovering spiritual gifts and, your, and who you are in Christ, I mean, that, that's all important. But I feel like there's been a neglect of something in this discussion, and that word is holiness. I would suggest to you that holiness, that is becoming like Jesus, is the goal of the Christian life. Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race set out before us. And what is this race? In verse 14, pursue holiness, run after holiness, seek holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You see, the race we run is toward holiness. The great pursuit of the Christian life is holiness, and without it, we're disqualified from the prize. Jamie Camp, don't you just love that brother? He did so good last week. We were so, we've been so blessed the last several weeks. Jamie, uh, last Sunday, and then, and then we had Dr. Karuku on some, that one Sunday night service. Man, it's just so good. But anyway, Jamie, I, can, man, I get so blessed with these guys. I'm sorry, I just I keep reflecting on what they say and how they minister to us. And Jamie brought us back. He, he, told, he reminded us that the mission of the church is to make disciples of all nations. But friends, I would suggest to you that that's the mission of the church. But we are called. Our personal mission is to pursue holiness. We are called to pursue it and to run after it and to do our best to attain it. And friends, I will tell you that holiness is not obedience to a set of rules, but it is a relationship with the ruler. It's a relationship with the ruler. And any form of holiness that is not rooted in a deep relationship with Jesus is legalism and is not holiness at all. It's counterfeit and it's worthless. It will not save you. There is no salvation apart from a personal relationship with Jesus. See, holiness is, is rooted in that loving relationship with Jesus. I mean, think about what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Amen. Jesus said, love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, when, when the, the pursuit of holiness, when it's motivated by religious pride, or willpower, it will fail. But when we pursue Jesus, when He is the object of our affection, then love becomes the reason for obedience, and love is willing to pay any price. Amen. You see, relationship, relationship versus religion. When it's relationship, it becomes, I want to obey. But when it's religion, it's I have to obey. I want to versus I have to. How many of you know that I want to gets a whole lot more accomplished than I have to? Are you with me? I want to brings joy. I have to brings fear. I have to brings frustration and weariness. Frankly, I think the reason why so many in the body of Christ are joyless, why they're bored, and why this has become drudgery is because they have forsaken their first love. The heart is lukewarm. When you love, 
When your love and your relationship with the Lord is on fire, holiness becomes your passion and your joy, not your ball and chain. Serving the Lord is your joy. Listen, let me, let me try to make it say it another way. If this ain't fun, if you don't like being here, if you don't like worshiping, if you don't like being in His presence, if you don't like studying His Word, if you don't like being in prayer, if, if, if this isn't fun, if this is not something you enjoy, friend, just let me say it's real simple. Something is wrong. Amen. Something's wrong. <clears throat> let me give you Fielding's definition of holiness. It's this. Holiness, listen, holiness is the life of Christ. His morals and values, his attitudes and passions, his words and deeds on display in my life. In short, holiness is thinking, living, and speaking like Jesus. Amen. Paul said... Paul said in Ephesians 4, he, he defined holiness. He said it is attaining to the full measure of the stature of Christ. He said we will grow up into, in all things into Christ himself. That's maturity. That's holiness. Becoming like Jesus is the goal. Now here in Hebrews 12, 1, where we, where we began, the writer tells us, he says, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race set before us. The race toward holiness, friend, listen to me, it's important for you to get this, is a marathon. Christ likeness is not a sprint. No one gets the nature of Christ quickly. This thing is a journey down a long road that climbs many mountains and goes down through some narrow passes. It's an unpopular road that the multitudes bypass. It's a hostile road filled with dangers. It's a hard road that requires perseverance and patience. We're called to run with endurance the race set out before us. This course to holiness is hard and it demands endurance. And my friend, do you want to know what endurance is? Endurance means you never stop moving your feet. It means you never stop moving your feet. Yes, we're called to run. The text says run. But sometimes that road becomes so difficult and the struggle becomes so great and sometimes the terrain is so rough that you can't walk. Your legs are weary, your feet are heavy, but endurance means you keep moving your feet anyway. If you can't run, if you can't run, walk. Keep moving forward, do not quit, do not turn back. When it seems impossible to reach the goal, keep moving anyway. If you've stumbled and fallen, get back up and start again. When you're discouraged because people are passing you and bypassing you and you feel like you're being left behind, so what? Keep moving anyway. It's a marathon. Just keep moving forward. Do not quit. Progress, friends, progress is what you're looking for. Daily progress, one foot in front of the other. Just keep going. And if you just keep going, you'll be surprised. When you look back, you'll see how far you've come. Remember this, Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Friend, if you don't give up, he'll get you there. If you don't quit, he'll get you there. Now, I need to give you some practical stuff. Are you ready? Now that I got you pumped up and you're with me. <laughs> let's get down. Let's get dirty. I'm going to say some things you ain't going to like. I want to encourage you to make your race easier. Let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles. The journey to holiness is already hard, but... I, 
but sometimes we make it impossible. We make it impossible on ourselves. We make it so difficult. We are our own worst enemy. You know, if you look on the front of your bulletin, I, wa I want you to look at the picture. I want you to look at the picture. Imagine you're standing at the starting line of the Boston Marathon. That's what you're going to see, right? You're going to see the runners. They're, they're going to be dressed wearing light clothing, shorts, and, and, and running shoes. You don't see a businessman standing there in a three-piece suit and, and tie and wingtips. You don't see some, you don't see a lady standing there in a long flowing gown in pumps. Okay? That's not the way you run a right race. No one's standing there with a big, bulky, heavy winter coat. Not only would they look out of place, they would look kind of foolish. But friends, we, we seem to have a propensity of sabotaging our ability to run this race. Like that man in the suit or like that woman in pumps at the Boston Marathon, we, we enter the race with too much baggage and then wonder why we fail. Are you with me? Yes. Is this making sense to anybody? Yes. <laughs> How? How do we do that? Encumbrance. Weight, some translations say. Weight that, that hinders and sin that so easily entangles. Holiness is not an accident, my friend. Those who finish the race make intentional choices and deliberate decisions that enable them to run. The text says, throw off the weights. Throw off the hindrances. Throw off the encumbrances. Throw off the sin that entangles. And who is in charge of throwing them off? Let us. That means you. That means me. Let us throw them off. We are responsible for shedding these things so that we can run unimpeded. Too many of us are expecting God to remove these, these hindrances and these entanglements from our lives. Too many of us are waiting on Jesus to do it for us when he has instructed us to do it for ourselves. Stop wearing yourself out prematurely. Throw off those weights that hinder. Throw off the sin that entangles. Remember this. Jesus said, my yoke is what? Easy. And my burden is what? Nice. So if you are weighed down and you are overburdened, if the load you're carrying isn't easy and light, friends, you've got too much baggage. You're carrying too much, and that's why you can't go. You know, flying, flying these days has become, what do you want to call it? Difficult. I mean to tell you, it's gotten expensive. There's got rules about everything. And one of the rules they have is, I mean, if you've got to check a piece of luggage, they're going to weigh it. It varies from airline to airline, but man, if your luggage is over 50 pounds or 75 pounds, depending on the ticket you bought, they're going to stick that thing on a scale, and they're going to weigh it. And if it's too much, you get a surcharge. When we took our trip to Haiti back in 19, one of, one of our people, I'll let the guilty party remain nameless so they don't be embarrassed. But we, we actually had a scale downstairs and we were weighing our luggage before we left to make sure that everything, but this person, they, did, they, they stuck a couple extra things in their bag and it cost them 75 bucks. Too many of us are paying a high price for those things that we perceive to be necessities. The weight that hinders and the sin that entangles. Weights and sin. Let's start with the sin thing first. I think that's easier to understand. You know what sin is. Sin is doing that which the Bible says don't. Sin is failing to do what the Bible says do. Right? And the Bible's pretty clear about this. The Bible defines what sin is, and yet... We find ourselves trying to justify our sin, excuse our sin. They're trying to change the definition of what sin is. Some people try to ignore their sin. But friends, the Bible is clear about sin, and you can never win an argument with Jesus. He knows what sin is. Okay? 
I was once talking with a young lady who, I, it, it's still mind boggling to me that this person would, would, would want my advice. They, they contacted me about, see her boyfriend asked her to move in. And they said, she said to me, she said, well, what do you think? Well, this is kind of like a no-brainer, right? I mean, I know what I think. I know what the Word of God says. The Bible, Bible says no. Well, after I shared scripture with her, I, I tried to be polite. I, I really did. I, I, I got to admit, I was a little shocked, a little stunned that anybody would ask the preacher if it's okay to move in with her boyfriend. But then she got defensive with me. She got to, and let, let me say this, if you're looking for counsel and you refuse to listen, you're not really looking for, you're lo not really looking for advice, you're looking for somebody to validate your sin. This preacher won't do that. I won't do it. Now, and then finally our phone conversation ended with, listen, your argument is not with me, your argument is with God. So you can't win an argument with Jesus. You'll never successfully run a race while tolerating known sin in your life. I'm sorry. Nothing will trip you up as quickly as sin. The sin, look what it says, that so easily entangles. Nothing stops your spiritual growth and, and your race toward holiness like sin. It so easily entangles. In fact, the Greek word there, when I looked it up, it means thwarting, I had trouble getting that word up, thwarting progress in every direction. You can't go anywhere when you're in sin. You're stuck. Now, I don't believe that the scripture here is talking about addictive, habitual sin, those sins that we feel powerless to break. I, we're going to talk about that next week. I think that's Hebrews 12.4 when, when we get there. But Because those sins we're fighting, those sins we're resisting, those sins we hate, we're trying to get rid of them. We, we are making incremental progress in them. We really are. But what, what th this verse here, though, is talking about you know it's wrong, but you don't resist it. You know it's wrong, but you accept it. I guess that's just the way I am. You know it's wrong, but you try to manage it and keep it just a little bit hidden in your life. You know it's wrong, but it doesn't seem that bad to you. You know it displeases God, but you hold on to it anyway. What we're talking about is deliberate, willful, no sin that entangles and snares, and it stops spiritual growth in your life. I don't know how to sugarcoat this, guys. I told you you're not going to like me. If you're resisting and fighting, friends, I'm telling you, God's with you. You're advancing. God will help you. Progress might be really, really slow. There might be a lot of falling down, but you're moving. But where deliberate sin is concerned, there is no, there can be no progress. Friend, if you, if, you have that, if you have that kind of sin in your life, you know you're doing wrong. Friend, listen to me. Repent. Yeah. Start fighting it. And my goodness, let's just be honest. I've been there. I've been there where, where I knew that I was stepping into some things that I, had no, that I was tolerating things that I knew I had no business doing. And, and you know why? Because I wanted it. I wanted that more than I wanted Jesus. And that reveals that, 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 that your heart's not right. And so if that's you, if you're in a place where you know that you're tolerating sin in your life, Frank, can I just tell you, man, if, if you don't have it within you to resist, if you don't have it within you to repent yet, then at least pray this. Jesus, help me. Change my heart. The other hindrance that is discussed here, he calls weights or encumbrances. Weights that hinder or encumbrances that, that impede progress. Now these things are a little interesting. They're, they're, they're not sinful in and of themselves. The Bible may not address it. The Bible may not forbid it. And sometimes they're actually good things, things that God blesses us with, but, but they're out of balance in our lives. Even good things can become hindrances. Too much of a good thing's bad. I mean, let's, let's just be real. Coffee is good. Too much coffee. It's good. Probably not good. Okay? <laughs> Probably not good. Are you, are, are you with me on this? You understand what I'm trying to say? 
So we're to get rid of the sin that easily entangles and we're also to throw off the, the weights that impede. Let's talk about this. The weight that hinders. Now, I, I got to tell you, when I study God's word and I dig, I, sometimes you'll, you'll catch me laughing. You'll catch me chuckling. This is one of them. I was reading one commentator on this passage and he suggested that maybe what he, the weight that he's talking about is this weight. A donut. And you know if you eat too many donuts, you'll get a donut. Because you are what you eat. Right? You are what you eat. And I do got to tell you, I've never seen a chubby marathon runner. I don't think chubby marathon runners exist. But whether it's, whether the weight is fat or just excess baggage, it'll definitely hinder your journey. I can think of three things. That I would, I just three ways of looking at this that I want, I want you to consider. Extra weight wears you out because it requires extra energy to carry. Think about that. These things also hinder because it leads you into greater temptation. And too much of a good thing is problematic. Let's talk about this extra weight first that wears you out. When I was in Bible school, uh, I was part of a team that took a trip to, Eng a missions trip to England. And uh, we did a lot of traveling across that nation. We saw a great, great, uh, man, there had to be, man, I, I forget now, 50 people come to Christ. It was just great to see. And, uh, but they told us that we've been doing a lot of off and on, in and out of buses and planes, and we'd be, we'd be dragging our luggage to various places. So they told us, they said, the, 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 the leader said, look, Pack light. Now we were gone for, I, my memory serves me like two weeks. Pack light for two weeks. Now I gotta tell you, there's a difference between what I think of as packing light and what a girl thinks of in packing light. I fit everything into one suitcase. One medium sized suitcase with wheels. But the girls that was with us on this trip, they had multiple bags, and they were heavy. And we did have to walk a long ways from different sites to different sites in the city where, you know, anyway. What was even better, though, was the single guys. The single guys, they had to be gentlemen. I was married. They had to be nice. I didn't care. I stood and laughed at all of them trying to carry this luggage. I was married and glad I was. Now, spiritually, though, these, these hindering weights are extras. They're non-essentials that rob us of time and energy and focus that belongs to God. Things that we maintain and engage that produce little spiritual fruit. Things like hobbies, even career, entertainment, your family. Your family priorities can become a weight. You know, children and grandchildren, I can speak freely because Donna's not here, are, are a gift and a blessing from God. But, but, we, but when we start putting them ahead of God, our spiritual growth and our spiritual priorities, they become excess weight and a hindrance. Too busy chasing your, your kids and grandkids from one event to another, one, one thing to another, again and again and again. Too busy to, to be at church. Too busy to be at Bible study. Too busy to be in His Word. Too busy to be in prayer. Friend, let me tell you something. If you're neglecting your relationship with God, pursuing a relationship with your children and your grandkids, it's gone too far. Too far. Too heavy. I remember reading an article by uh, Francis Chan. He talked about the idolatry of family. I thought, whoa, I read that article. I was like, man, preach that one. You better be brave. There's going to be a lot of unhappy soccer moms. You know? Hobbies. There's nothing wrong with having a hobby. There's nothing wrong with golfing, fishing, hunting, crafting, camping. 
sports, watching sports. But when they displace spiritual priorities, it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem. I remember one Sunday I was, I was on my way to, to, to the church and I stopped by this gas station that had really good coffee and I, I poured myself a cup. And as I was coming out, one of my guys pulled in with his Ford pick -em up truck and, and his fishing boat. And he was fueling up. And I gotta tell you, he was not happy to see me. He tried to hide. <laughs> Because I knew that he, I would not see him in church that day. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, brother, how are you? And he just kind of drives me, I'm fine, Pastor. I said, uh, headed out to the lake, huh? And he said, yes, Pastor. And, and, and I said to him, I said, you know, fishing is always better after church than during church. And you want to know what's funny? Do you know how much, you know what he caught that day? <laughs> the next Sunday he was in church and he told me, he said, hey pastor, uh, I'm not going fishing during church today. I'm going to go after church. And you know, he did go after, he, you know, he, he limited out on crappie that day. You know, God's not against fishing. That's what I'm trying to get you to say. But when these things dominate our lives, when, they come, when, when, when we begin to put more of a priority on these good things than on Jesus, friends, they become a weight that hinders our growth. You know, we entertain ourselves to death. We entertain ourselves. Everybody always seems to have a screen in front of their face. We can't go 15 minutes without looking and see what's happening. I remember... I remember driving down the road one time, and I was, I, I was newly saved, and I, and I had, this will tell you how long ago it was, I, I had cassette tapes, <laughs> and, and, I popped, and I popped it into my, into my car. I mean, I had an hour and 20 minute drive to work every day, and I would be jamming out to, uh, to, to, to Petra and to Striper, and you know, those ones, I just, you know, that was an hour. And, uh, and I'd be jamming out, and, and there was one song, I, I can't remember the song now, but the lyric was talking about hearing, hearing the voice of God. And I remember singing and saying, saying, Lord, I would love to hear your voice. And I did. You know what he said? He said, shut it off. <laughs> shut it off and I'll talk to you. Shut it off and I'll listen to you. Shut off all that noise and I'll speak to you. And I'm telling you, if there's a call that God is putting out today, He's saying, shut these things off. Get along with me. And I will speak to you. We entertain ourselves to death. I know it is. <laughs> God wants your undivided attention. He doesn't want, you know, He doesn't. And it drives me nuts too, you know, even, even at our dinner table and the, even at, like, when we go out to dinner as a family and all the kids, you know, we're, we're doing this. We're half listening to each other. No. You know, we might have to put up with that from each other, but God won't. God wants your undivided attention. Just saying. The second aspect of these weights that hinder, things that lead you into temptation. They might not necessarily be wrong, but they put you in a position where you can be easily led astray. Now, I had one of my daughters send me a text message this week, and it made me proud and chuckle. She said, Dad, when I was younger, I used to really get irritated that whenever I would do something that isn't necessarily classified as a sin, I would feel guilty even though friends and Christians would do it without thinking anything of it. Like dumb, teeny things that aren't wrong, but for whatever reason it was wrong for me. I would really get irritated because it seemed like God and the Holy Spirit held me to a higher standard of right and wrong. Here, here, here's the part that, that made me smile, but here's the part that made me proud. Actually, backwards. And now I understand that, that it's your fault 
because you just had to raise me right. <laughs> That's the kind of thing we're talking about. Here. Re relationships. You can be in relationships that will be a hindrance to your spiritual growth, especially if it's the opposite sex. I ah, can't say opposite sex anymore. <laughs> Any sexual attraction outside of marriage. Things that are that are heavy, worldly environments, parties, dances, movies, bars, beaches, all that kind of stuff, right? You know, it's not it's not wrong to go to the beach, but but you know, but it might not be a good idea because it'd be a real hindrance. I I don't know how any red blooded American man can go to the beach and see all that skin and be okay. I'm just saying. Not not if you really want Jesus. You know, you might go to a bar to hang out with your buddies. You may never drink. You may never do it. You just may be there for the, just to hang out with your friends and eat some wings. Nothing wrong with hanging out with your friends and eating wings. But, but where are you though? I'm telling you in that, in that kind of heavy worldly place, it just does something to my spirit. It just doesn't feel right to me. A movie. A movie can be a great escape, man. I mean, Don and I used to go to movies quite a bit, but here lately, we can't find a decent movie to go see. You know, there's this thing called Movie Guide, Christian Movie Guide. You can look it up. They'll tell you about every, everything that's in it. And I'm like, I'll pull up the movie, you know. Nope, can't go to that one. Never mind. Not as good as I thought. We can't find one. But you got to be careful about these things because it messes with your heart. And, and, and now I'm, you know, if I haven't stepped on your toes yet, I know I'm going to step on toes, but I love you. And, hey, I've already been here 18 years. I, you know, well, how are you going to get rid of me? I, I, I'm just a fixture, you know. So, whatever. Take, take the anniversary, by the way. But alcohol. I'm just going to say it, Alcohol. And I suppose I got to put this out there now too. Smoking a doobie. So it's legal. I mean, we, we went and got ice cream last night and they're smoking marijuana out in the middle of the park. I thought to myself, you got to be kidding me. You know? Now look, I know that nowhere in the Bible does it expressly forbid the drinking of alcohol. It, it forbids drunkenness. But I say to you, where does it lead? Remember, it's a weight. It's a weight that brings you into temptation. And Paul said in Ephesians 5.18, he said, Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Another translation says, Do not be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Friends, nothing good comes from drinking. Nothing. It just leads to reckless indiscretion, and it ruins your life. Get rid of that weight. Why be encumbered with something so senseless as, as wine, beer, or, or, or a, 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 a THC gummy bear? It's not worth it. And besides, being filled with the Spirit is so much better than being intoxicated. And then there's this other thing, too much of a good thing. <laughs> Taken to an excess... Just about anything can become a problem. You know, exercising and working out is a good thing. You know, Paul said physical exercise is of limited value. <laughs> but godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise in the present life and in the one to come. You know, there are people who have dedicated their whole life to the gym. They neglect their family. They neglect personal devotions. They don't have time for their children. They spend hours at the gym. They don't have time for prayer. But they got time to work out. That's gone too far. Too much of a good thing. How about this one? Ministry. Church. You know, we're called to serve. We are called to serve. But not at the expense of our relationship with Jesus. What? Oh yeah. Trust me. You can get so caught up in doing things at the church and for the church and for people that you neglect yes. Jesus. 
When your prayer time suffers, when that, that your, your downtime with Jesus, when your fellowship, your intimacy with Christ, that your, your prayer closet is empty. If you're that busy here at the church, please take a step back. We'll find somebody else. I would rather have you on your face before God. I would rather have you in the Word. I would rather have your relationship with Jesus on fire. I'm just telling you. Give me an amen here from the front row. Come on, you two. You're here. I need some help. I'm telling the truth, ain't I, Connie? Tell the truth. And you know, I've had... Listen, I have had spouses, I've had husbands, I've had wives complain about, the, about their, 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 their marriage is suffering. Kids are, are suffering because their parents are so busy at the church doing things at the church. Listen, that should never be. That should never be. It's not a, the church should never be in competition with your kids. Your, the church should never, your ministry should never be in competition with your spouse when it's balanced. It, they, they, they mesh together beautifully. But when it gets out of balance, you've got a problem. And if your marriage is suffering and your relationship with your kid or your, kid, your kids are a mess, then there's a problem, friend. There's a problem happening there. Balance. A.W. Tozer. I know Cody is really an A.W. I love A.W. I've read every book that, ever, that, I, that I'm aware of. I think I have read everything that A.W. Tozer has written. How, how many of you know who I'm talking about? That guy is awesome. His writings are so deep and so wonderful and challenging. I love reading them. But he was out of balance. He passed away in his middle 60s, I think. And he said something, he said, the, or, I'm sorry, his wife said this. She said after he passed and after she remarried a guy by the name of Leonard, this is what she said. She said, I have never been happier in my life. Aiden, A.W. Tozer, loved Jesus Christ, but Leonard loves me. I never want my wife, I never want Donna to say that about me. I mean, I want her to say, yeah, Ken loves the Lord, but he loves me. Ken, and I never want my kids to say, yeah, my dad really does love the church and ministry, but he doesn't love me. Never! It's sad, man. I'm thinking, I, 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 gotta, I gotta move on. That is sad. Sad. So this morning, Cody, I, I don't know if Don's going I don't know if he's doing what today, but I want you to think about weights and sins that's hindering your race, that's hindering your, your growth, that's hindering your pursuit of holiness. Weights and sins that's in the way, that's, that's, that's hindering you. I mean, I think most of us, I think most of us in the room, not all of us, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, there, there's a couple of y'all that are skinny. I think most of us could probably lose a couple pounds and be the better for it. Okay? Yeah, 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 don't applaud that. Mind your own business, Cody said. No, really, I, I need you to stop and think about this. You know, there's just too many good things that compete for our attention and displace God. I mean, we live in the greatest nation on earth still. God's blessing is so evident in our, in our lives. But we are fat with creature comforts and lean on spiritual health. What things? I need you to think. I need you. To, I need you to pray about this. I need you to kind of, kind of put things in balance in your life. What things? Not simple things. Maybe good things are hindering your pursuit of holiness and a vital relationship 
with the Holy One, with Jesus. Look, I'm going to throw it out there one more time. Don't tell me this ain't a problem. You ain't gonna, I'm not buying it. Run, your, run, run that app up, run that thing on, on, your, on your settings and, and, and show me your screen time. It don't lie. What areas are you leaving yourself vulnerable? I mentioned alcohol. You know, your friends drinking a glass of wine with your dinner, a beer with your pizza. Is it really worth it? I've never once heard anybody say, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to go home and crack a cold one and get closer to Jesus. <laughs> it's not productive. Take it to the Lord. Get rid of the encumbrances. Get rid of the weights. Lay them aside so you are freer and lighter and can pursue Jesus. The other part talked about sin that entangles. And I suggested to you, I really think that he's talking about known sin. Sin that we're just saying, ah, I can manage this. It's not that bad. It's okay. It's not. You can, you can try to twist it and turn it any way you want. The only person that you're lying, the only person that, that's buying your lie is you. It's time to, to lay aside these things so that our primary goal, holiness and the Holy One, Jesus, is the focus, is where we're spending ourselves. That's where it's at, guys. stand with me. Why don't you take these things to Jesus? Take them to the Lord. Ask Him to really get a hold of your heart. All of it. things as we wrap up. One is this. If you want to have an argument with me about something I said, I love you. And I, and I will, and seriously, I will, I'm not going to yell at you. You can yell at me, I don't care, but I'm not going to yell at you. If we, if we need to have an honest conversation, if I can take you to the Bible, if I can just you know lay things out with you and help you to understand, I'd be glad to. I love you too much to, you know, I'm not going to blow you off. I'm going to do that too. 
So if, if we need to talk, we can talk. I, I'm welcome. But I want that person this morning. In, in, in my message, I was talking about that one early on where, man, you're stumbling, you're falling, the road is hard, you're really struggling, you're discouraged, you're having trouble putting one foot in front of the other right now. You're trying to keep moving, but, man, you're just struggling. If that's you, I, I just want to pray with you. Why don't you just come and just, just, just let me pray with you. Come on. You want to keep moving, you want to keep going, but you are really struggling right now. 